Well, welcome to the sixth session of A Life Well Lived. Tonight we are going to talk about taking action. So the Bible verse for this week is Psalms 119, verses 133 through 135. And it says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. If our steps are ordered of the Lord, it's the Lord's house that's being built, and that house cannot be broken down or stopped. So we pray with the psalmist to order our steps in thy word. There are three areas that we're going to cover tonight. The first area is overcoming stress by planning time well. When we consider taking action, we have to consider how do we stop, how do we turn off some of that stress in our lives. Then removing distractions. We not only live out in one of the most stressed out societies in the world, we live in one of the most distracted societies in the world. And then finally, I'm going to do a session called the Daily Jesus Planning Meeting. All right, so let's start about talking a little bit about stress. Now, what causes stress? Why, why are we stressed out all of the time? What, why are we running in a frenzy and just having the weight of the world on us? I think there's a lot of areas that cause stress, but specifically tonight I'm going to talk about two. And I believe they're the two biggest causes of stress. The first is information overload. Our brains can only hold so much information. I think a lot of times we think we are a lot more capable than we actually are. Contrary to popular belief, we aren't God. God is God. We can only hold a limited amount of information. We, we are not an encyclopedia. I've tried to be an encyclopedia. It didn't work very well. Um, so why, why, one of the reasons that we have so much stress is we take in so much information and we don't have an outlet for it. So it sits around kind of cluttering up our brain. Uh, Eric Schmidt, who is the CEO of Google, said, we create as much information in two days as we did from the dawn of man through 2003. Now think about that. From the dawn of man till 2003, we create as much information as our, in our society as man did for that many years. Think about that. If you drive down the road, you are going to be hit with uh, uh, advertisement for this and uh, advertisement for that. When you turn on the TV, there's constant information overload and there's tools and practices and ideas and thoughts and entertainment and it's just flooded at us. So much so that we've begun to think that's the way that it is. That's the way that we should live. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes it's hard to just sit still and quiet. I get in the car and turn off the radio, and that feels a little, little weird. You know, there's nobody yelling at me. There's no big loud noise, just brrrr. But we're not designed for that constant flux of noise. How do we overcome stress? Number one, we need to recognize knowledge as a tool. Now, one of my cousins is a mechanic. And uh, if you've ever worked with a mechanic or you know a mechanic, mechanics love their tools. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I have this tool. It's like, that's my number four socket wrench and don't mess with it. I mean, tools are critical. They're critical because you need a specific tool to fix a certain problem. And the more tools you have, especially as a mechanic, the better a mechanic you are. I mean, they have walls of tools. They have the right tool to lift the car in the air, take off the tires, fix the engine, you know, heat something up to the right temperature, get the exact right torque uh, on that screw. And so having a lot of tools is a good thing. Having a lot of information, having a lot of knowledge is also a good thing. But how silly would it be if my mechanic walked around with all of his tools everywhere that he went? 
you know, Batman has this really cool utility belt where he's got like 15 different tools and he, he's, he's in good shape if he has to, you know, jump a building or something like that. But what if my mechanic was walking around with a three-ton floor jack and like a complete socket set and all these wrenches and they were just walking around all of the time with all of these tools? That would be crazy. You know what? We do that when we don't take the information that comes into our heads and put it out somewhere. We are constantly walking around with so much stuff floating around in our brain that it's just clutter. So until we take and have our toolbox where we take that important information and put it into a place where we can go and get it later, it floats around in our head. You know what that's called? All that stuff floating around in your head? Stress. If you've ever had the time to take and simply write down all of the problems that you're having, all the stuff that's floating around in your head, and just write it down on a piece of paper, and then take a deep breath, you know what happens after that? You feel better. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah, I've seen some heads. Why do you feel better? Has anything changed in your situation? Nothing has changed in your situation. The reason why you feel better is because now I have that all out of my head and it's down. And now all of that mental space that I was using to hold all that clutter is now open to be creative. And so we need to create a system that we can trust in order to store important facts and information. Knowledge is a tool, but don't walk around all the time with all the stress in your head. Get it out into a system that you can trust. The number one cause of stress is we've got too much information that stays in our head and doesn't get out into a system that we trust. The number two cause of stress is that we treat projects like they're tasks. Does everybody know the difference between a project and a task? Let's talk about growing a tomato. Now let's say I gave you a project of growing a tomato. What comes to mind, what do you have to actually accomplish to grow a tomato? Because we might think growing a tomato is a very simple process. So if I say, hey, go grow a tomato, you might just think, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get right on that. But I sat down and I thought about it. If I'm going to grow a tomato, what do I really have to do? And I just wrote down a little, uh, a little list. The first thing that I have to consider when I'm growing a tomato is where am I going to place it in the yard, right? So I have to figure out, well, where is it going to hit enough sun so that the sun comes down and the tomato grows and there's enough, you know, it's going to be a juicy red tomato or it, some tomatoes need more sun, some tomatoes need less sun. The second is, is I need to pick the kind of tomato that I want to have. Then I've got to purchase the tomato seed. I've got to purchase the right kind of fertilizer. I've got to purchase the right kind of support to hold that tomato up. I've got to dig a hole. I've got to put the support around the hole. I've got to water it. I've got to tamp it down. I've got to weed that tomato once it grows. So growing tomatoes is not a task. Growing tomatoes is a project. And if I try to think about growing tomatoes as a task, Every time I want to go do a part of that tomato, I have to pull up every single one of these into my mind to grow it. Now, let's say that these are the tasks of growing a tomato. And let's say that I am the best farmer in the entire world. So I really have got my tomato growing down. So I'm pretty hot stuff. I'm going to grow a tomato. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up this right here, this part of growing a tomato, and I'm going to walk it over here. So I'm going to say that this is picking the spot in my yard. Okay, so I, I did that part, and I got that done, and now, oh, I'm going to pick the kind of tomato. So I'm going to research the best kind of tomatoes that are all over there, and I picked the right kind of tomato, and I'm going to go over here, I picked the right tomato. Okay, this is great. I'm a pretty brilliant farmer, you can tell. This is, uh, this is a good tomato. T and then I'm going to purchase the tomato seed. Okay, here I go. Um, I purchase the tomato seed, and then I go back and I pick up this task. Now, this is the right way to do a project. I pick up one chair at a time. But you know what most of us do? We try to pick up a lot of chairs at the same time. So what we're trying to do is we have, a, instead of breaking everything down into tasks like the simple farmer, 
We want to make everything complex. So now what I'm trying to do is go, okay, i got to grow a tomato plant. So first I'm going to pick the kind of tomato, and then I'm going to put the right water that's in there, and then I'm going to, I'm going to go. And why am I so stressed out all the time? This is the hardest thing in the world. Guess what? No matter how brilliant and smart and capable you are as an individual, if you're a human, you can only do one thing at a time. And when you consider the tasks that you're doing and you think, oh, I can create a homeschool curriculum and you try to do that as one project and then you schedule on your calendar, create a homeschool curriculum, you're going to be stressed out. Or if you take a project at work on, like we're going to create a website for our, our church, well, that's an entire, that's too many tasks. So until we understand the difference between a project which has lots of tasks and a task which is one thing that we can actually do, we're going to be stressed mm -hmm. out all of the time. Does that make sense? The, so here's the, here's the takeaway. You're not as capable as you think. Every single one of us can only do one thing at a time. And I guarantee you, if you're trying to pick up more than you can actually do at a given time, you are going to be stressed out. Every person. This is what causes stress when we don't break down projects into tasks. I love this quote by William Henry Fisher. Knowledge is a process of piling up facts. Wisdom lies in their simplification. Okay, so we've been talking about in Life Well Lived, mission goals, projects, and tasks. So a mission might be having a healthy eating family by June 2015. A goal towards that mission would be plant a garden in my yard. A project would be grow a tomato plant. And then the tasks would be those tasks that we broke down, how to actually accomplish that, uh, that, that goal. So let me ask a question. Can you act on a mission? Can you wake up and say, I am going to have a healthy eating family by the end of the day? No, that's not possible. Can you act on a goal? I'm going to plant a garden, you know, in an hour. No, you can't do that. Can you even act on a project? No, you can only act on one task of that project. So in our lives, we need to distinguish between planning time and action time. The first step of taking action is realizing you can only take action on a task. I can only take action by picking up one chair at a time. So in our day, we need to break down projects into tasks. So the goal of planning time is to convert projects into tasks. How many of you have a set-aside planning time? One, two, three. Okay, how many of you are stressed out? Okay, every other hand, I see. So planning time, the goal of planning time is to break down your, your goals and your projects into tasks. Now. If you've ever had a planning meeting that becomes an idea brainstorm, at the end of that planning meeting, you're not going to be any better off. Hey, I've got this idea. I've got this idea. We could do this. We could do this. Wasn't this a great meeting? It was awesome. Everybody goes around, and then that next meeting, next week, everybody says, we need to have another meeting. Right. The goal of planning time is not to brainstorm. you got to set up brainstorming time to brainstorm. The goal of planning time is to break down your life area goals. What do you want to accomplish into projects and then break them down to tasks? What goes on the schedule is the task. So on my schedule every day on a Monday, when I consider what is it that I'm actually going to do today or what am I going to do next Tuesday, don't schedule projects. That'll stress you out. You can schedule time to plan for that project, but don't schedule the project itself. Does that make sense? Okay, 
This diagram right here should be tattooed on every operations manager of every major company in the world. And you know what? It is. It's tattooed in their brain. If you walk into a Home Depot store, what do all of the employees of Home Depot do? Are they doing projects, goals, or mission? No. They're doing tasks. I can walk down the aisle in a Home Depot. The first row is going to be electrical. The next row is going to be plumbing. The next row is going to be something else. And they have them all charted out, all figured out. They need to be stocked, but they have their entire company broke down to tasks. Do you think McDonald's does the same thing? Yes. Do you think any effective organization in the world does the same thing? Yes. Why shouldn't we do it in our own lives? Because we prefer being stressed out. So anyway, if you want to remove stress, separate planning time and action time. And remember, we can only do one thing at a time. OK, now here are tips for planning time. The, the, first, the first consideration when you, when you set down and consider a project is what is the time frame for the project? When does the project need to be done? We talked in the session about goals, about procrastinators and get it doneers and their differences and the, the strength of a time frame per each. But when you create that, that planning time to break down your projects into tasks, the first thing is to consider the time frame. The second is consider the steps for that project. In the tomato plant diagram, I wrote down all the steps for gr growing a, a, a tomato. And what that did is it simplified that process of growing a tomato, where all I had to do was the next thing. And I can check it off. If you're a, if you're a go-getter, you love those check boxes. So first consider the time frame, then consider the steps. The third, consider which of those steps require a team. It's always better to use a team than do something yourself. Can I get an amen? amen. God in himself is three people. So we, the self-made man is an illusion. There is no such thing. When you can use a team, use a team. So consider which steps require a team, and then you can plan right off of the bat, hey, when I get to stage three, I'm going to need to call so-and-so to help me do that, and then you can call them to get them prepped for working on it. The fourth is consider your role in that whole process, and then who fills the roles, uh, the other roles in the project. A lot of times we get into trouble when we, we try to put all of those roles into one, and we just think, oh, well, I've just got to get all this done. And we stress out about something that we can't even do. Have you ever done that? I, I do that all the time. I stress out about stuff that I can't even do. But if I've simply written down, this is my role, this is what I'm supposed to do, I need to make sure I do my role and then collect with and get other people to work on and do their roles. Finally, uh, you write down the actions or the tasks to complete each step. So if you do this, you can break down that project into tasks, um, and it's a good thing. Okay, now, removing distractions. If we want to take effective action towards our life area mission, we need to stay on target. This Bible verse is a promise. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Now, that is a promise. Have you ever wanted to know wisdom? Have you ever wanted to just be wise? Walk with those who are wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, this is a promise from the Word of God, and it's true. I've seen it in my own life. When I was hanging around with those high school guys that were kind of you know, living on the edge and doing stuff they shouldn't have do, I got into that crowd. I, I suffered harm because I hung out with fools. But if you hang out with the wise, you'll become wise. The second is track your talking time. Proverbs 14, 23 says, in all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. There are lots of people who think they're brilliant, 
because they talk brilliant. I don't want to see somebody who talks brilliant. I want to see somebody who lives brilliant. And the difference between somebody who talks brilliant and somebody who lives brilliant is what they achieve with their life. So in all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Track the amount of time that you spend talking about something versus doing it. Because the, the first part of this promise that I love so much is in all labor there is profit. How much labor? All. So that means if, if you are going and doing something and failing, it's still profitable. In fact, the most successful people that I've ever met have said that the path to success is failing over and over and not giving up. Fail, don't give up. Fail again, don't give up. Fail, don't give up. Succeed. In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. This is another one that says the same thing. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Have you ever needed to tell somebody something and you just didn't want to? So instead of talking directly about the, the, the problem, you kind of dance all the way around it? You know what happens during that time? Sin, transgression. So I don't want to talk about something, so I'll kind of make fun of this person or make it light in this situation or I'll tell this thing that I shouldn't have told or I'll do this, you know, and talk and talk and talk and all around instead of just saying what needed to be said and being honest about it. In the abundance of words, sin is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. We need to track our tongue if we want to act with power. Um, the third is to remove low-value priorities. So we talked about removing stress. If we plan well, we'll remove stress from our lives. But if we don't prioritize well, we're going to be very effective at doing things that have little value. So we need to prioritize well by removing low-value priorities. Now, here's a chart. And this is a great way to remove low-value priorities to free up time in our lives. Every one of us has 168 hours every week. If we're going to have successful lives, we need to plan our time effectively. Now, the way that you can create an effective time plan is first, write down on a schedule all of the things that you cannot get out of. If you go to a job, 9 to 5, 8 to 5, You've got to write down that time. So you've got your sleeping time, your eating time, and the time of stuff that's already booked. And guess what? When you look at what time is left, that time becomes a lot more valuable. And if we are going to live well in our life area goals, we need to make sure that that time we have left is being done in a proper priority to achieve our life area goals. So here is a way to track and find out what are those things that we should be doing right now in our life? And what are those things that we can push to the side? Um, so let's just say a person took their time and they, they took all of that extra time in their life area goals and they wrote down, here are the activities that I'm spending with my time. Church, TV, I'm a member of this club, I've got my hobby, and then I'm going back to school to advance my career. So what you do is from a scale of one to five, write down those activities. You might be in a job or you might have a series of jobs and you don't, you're not really sure if it's the right job. Or you might be doing some activities and, and they're stressing you out and you're not really sure, should I stay doing these activities? Well, here's one way that you can filter that out. So let's take church. And this person will go, well, they play the wrong music, they dress funny, and they're weird looking. But, you know, it's, I guess every time I go, I, I love to hear the sermons, it's good. So out of five, I'm going to give my passion for going to church as a three. Now, the impact, well, 
you know, it really, it really is impactful. I, I might not give it a five, but it, it really is making a difference in my life. And my going to church there has an impact. And, and growth, yeah, I am growing. I mean, that is really helping me to grow in my walk. It's helping me to be a better employee. It's helping me to be a better father. You know, I'm growing. Um, and man... I'm stuck going. My, the rest of my family's going. I, I'm obliged to go. If I don't go, I'm a deacon. I'm on the board of this. If I don't go, man, this is really bad. I'm stuck. And then eternal value. Well, you know, going to church and assembling with the brothers is commanded by Scripture. This is really important. This has an eternal value. I really need to do that. So I add up those numbers, and I've got a 21 there. So I look and I go, okay, well, out of 25, I've got a 21. This is, a, this is an important thing. So I might not be able to cross that one off the list. Now, let's look at the second most important thing in the world to many people, the television. So let's see, passion. Oh, man, that is a five. TV stands for time vacuum. This thing will just suck away your life. It, it's fun. I'm passionate about it. I love this. But... What is the impact that happens when I watch TV? Well, um, sometimes I smile at my wife. You know, okay, I got a one out of five. Well, what is the growth that's happening in my life? Well, this, I learn about really cool things on the Nature Channel. See, so this is really helping me out. So I've got a two here. Um, what is the obligation? Who's forcing me to watch TV? Nobody. We don't have to do that. And then what is the eternal value? Well, I'm, every once in a while, I'll hit that, you know, televangelist that says something right if they're not screaming or asking for money. But, um, but if I total that up, now, you know, that has a value of nine. So if one of my life area goals is to be physically fit, but I don't have time to do that because I've got to watch my TV show, you're not going to achieve your life area goal. So in order to move forward in action, we have to take out low-value priorities. So here's like the rest of this chart. These items might be, um, you know, something that you would do, but at the end, you take these totals and say, which of these do I really need to prioritize and which of these can I diminish? Where can I schedule and free up time for fulfilling some of my life area goals? That's a value activity chart. And uh, that's a really good tool. Okay, so the final session we're going to talk about is the daily Jesus planning meeting. God has unlimited resources available in every area of our lives, and he is willing to meet with us every day. Now think about that. There's, there's, there's two points of that statement. Number one God has unlimited resources. You're going through the hardest thing that has ever happened. If only somebody had the answer, God has the answer. There's no way that this, I'm in this financial crush, I, this can never happen. God has the answer. He has unlimited resources. God has unlimited resources. He can bring them about. But that's only half of the equation. The second half is he is willing to meet with us. When Jesus asked the dis when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, he said, "Pray like this: Our Father, dear Daddy." It's not just that he has these resources, but he is willing to meet with us. He wants us to call him Father, Dad. I've got a major problem here. Help me out. And he's willing to meet with us. Are we willing to meet with him? Or do we turn to ourself or the self-help book or the radio or the noise or all of the other stuff that's out there? God has unlimited resources and he's willing to meet with us every day. The second, there are divine appointments that are set up for us every day and we should be prepared for them. Every day, there is a God appointment for you. God has that. He has set up from the beginning of time an incredibly important and fruitful time of meeting with someone. Do you know that? 
He has prepared you for it. He's preparing someone else for it. But tomorrow morning when you wake up, are you preparing yourself for it? I have a pastor friend named Paul Burns. He, he prays every morning. And he prays for the people that he's going to meet that day. If he's going into the office, he prays for every person that he's going to see at the office. If he has a lunch meeting, if I have a lunch meeting with Paul Burns, I know that he has prayed for me that day. And we have that same opportunity to calibrate our day for who are we going to meet that day? What God appointments are set up? And then when we recognize them, it's just exhilarating. And we don't miss them because we're looking for them. So every day we need to meet with God. He has the answers and he's willing to meet with us and he can prepare us for the actions that are gonna happen that day. So in the Life Well Lived session two, we talked about commitment and then we talked about studying. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we we meet with God by studying that word of God that brings a lamp and a light. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. The second is we spend time in prayer. Martin Luther said, I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Who's stronger, you or God? I mean... When we connect with our daddy, we can ask him to go lift things that are too heavy for us. Guess what we can lift? We can lift one thing at a time, one task at a time. You know what God can lift? The entire building that you're standing on. So when we spend time with God in prayer, we connect with him, and he gets things done. The next we just spoke about, consider your meeting time like my pastor friend Paul Burns. You are the light of the world. You know, you can't have darkness and light in the same place. If you walk into a dark room and it's completely black, so pitch black, there's no outside light, you can't see anything, and you light a match, suddenly you can see everything in that room from a tiny little light. We are the light of the world when we follow Christ. It's why, are, you know, we spend way too much time complaining about darkness. Oh, this is so evil. Oh, this is so bad. Oh, this is so tragic. You know what that means? Nobody has turned on the light. That's our job. We are the light of the world. And so when we, comp- when we plan our meetings, when we consider what we're going to do in the day, consider how we can turn on that light and be a light in the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If I don't remember every morning that I am the light of the world and the salt of the earth, I'm going to spend my day complaining about everybody else's darkness. But if I simply calibrate and remember by reading the word and praying to God, then I can spread light in every meeting, in every circumstance, and everywhere that I go. And that is a blessed opportunity. Consider your priorities and goals. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Um, we can only do a certain amount of tasks in every day. So we can either sit there and ask ourselves what we should do, or we can talk with God and have a little Jesus planning meeting and ask him what we ought to be doing. Guess which will give more results. Consider and schedule our tasks. Give us this day our daily bread. And finally, be still and listen expectantly. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Now this verse, this is the verse for the stressed out. Like, like, um, in my life, I read this verse in another translation that says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. 
Now, I found myself in a very stressed out season. And everything just seemed so hard and everything was just toppling down on me. And I ran from here to there trying to do all this stuff. And I read this verse and it said, in repentance and rest is my salvation. And I said to myself, I need salvation right now. I need help from my situation. I need saved. And I prayed and I read this verse and I said, okay, well, in rest and repentance is my salvation. And I thought, well, I can rest. Okay, I can take a day off and I can kick back. But what do I need to repent about? I keep short accounts with God. I don't have, you know, I, I don't have any unconfessed sin that I know of. So what is it that I need to repent about? And I went on a prayer walk and I prayed and, and, uh, and I came back after a while and I still didn't have my answer. So I went on another prayer walk. And on that prayer walk, I was saying, God, what do I need to repent of? And you know what God said to me? He said, you have made an idol out of yourself. You have been living life like you're the one responsible to get things done and like you're the one that has the strength to get things done. When in all reality, the only thing that you can do is walk in the strength that I give you. And I... I'm guilty of that. We, it's easy to make an idol of ourself, to think that we can even understand or fix or help situations when God doesn't give us that right. He is God. Deuteronomy 4.39 says, Know therefore this day and consider it in your hearts that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. A lot of times we're stressed out because we're trying to play God and do more than he has given us the anointing to do. But when we sit at Jesus' feet every morning and we ask him, what is it that you have called me to do? Then we sit and wait. There's a psalm that says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. And so as we meet with Jesus, one of the most important things, we study the word, we spend time in prayer, we consider the meetings, we consider our priorities and goals, we write down the schedule and the tasks of what we have to do, but then we sit and recognize where the source of strength comes from for our lives and make sure that we're lined up in what God has called us to do. And finally, we take action. It is not in playing the great man that you have a life well lived. It's in doing small things well and following God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, Lord, I, I, my passion, my deep passion, Lord, is that every person in this room, every person that listens to this message or watches this video will not have a life mission to be distracted, but will have a life mission to bring you glory and to live well. And Lord, we've taught through how to plan goals, how to align with your goals. And today we talked, Lord, about taking action. Father, uh, James said, you show me um, your faith uh, by your words, and I'll, oh, I can't even remember what he said right, but God, faith without works is dead. And if we, are, if we, if we want to be a Christian, Lord, you've called us not just to uh, talk, but to act. And Lord, we know that that requires discipline, and none of us like discipline. And we know that that requires submission to your plans, and none of us like to do that. So I pray, God, that you would supernaturally give us the grace to receive instruction from your hand and to have the discipline to order our steps well according to your word. I pray, Father, that you would do a miracle and give us each 
abundant and full lives that are undistracted and full of salt and light as your word instructs. And we pray this in the matchless name of Christ Jesus. Amen.